Good morning. We are so glad that you're here with us uh, to worship God in song. So I want to invite you to, to stand as we worship um, and uh, just praise God. your praise in the morning light and I'll call out your name on the edge of night sometimes it's a song of joy sometimes a sacrifice still I sing still I will sing in the battle Sing in the blessing, sing through the shadows, shout with the heavens. I won't be silent, no, I won't be silent, still I'll sing, still I will sing. Father, I just pray that you will teach us how to be faithful and how to, to praise you in any moment, God. And uh, Father, we thank you so much um, as we study the book of Acts this summer um, for your kingdom, that your kingdom isn't something that is far off and, and a long time away, God, but your kingdom is here and it is now, that, that you came uh, to begin to, to plant the seeds of your kingdom, God, and that we get to choose, we get to, choose to be part of it. Um, that we can take part in, in what you're doing, and we thank you so much for that. Jesus, let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one great. Let 
glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name. King of heaven, come. God through the giving of our gifts and tithes. And as we prepare to do that, I just want to make you aware of a few opportunities that you have to give of yourselves. Um, in a couple weeks, on July 24th, we're going to be having um, just a summer party or gathering here at the church on the front lawn. Um, crafts, games, food, a cookout at noon, and this is for all ages. I know with COVID, a lot of us haven't seen one another in about a year, a year and a half. So if you're in town, feel free to join us for that and bring a lawn chair. This Wednesday from 6 to 8, if you are a teen between the grades of 6 through 12, we're having a youth cookout at the Kerr residence. So we would love to see you there. And finally, in a couple months, we have um, several families who are wanting to join the church. So we'll be offering a new member class. Um, so if you're interested in joining the church, becoming a new member, or maybe just learning a little bit more about our church or the Methodist faith, um, more information will be coming on that. But see me or Carol, the church office, we'd love to have you a part of that. So the ushers come, let us worship with our giving. If you're troubled, heavy hearted, come to Jesus and find your peace. If you're
we connect with God is through a time of prayer and as we prepare to do so just a couple of prayer concerns I want to share with you um, the first is a joy I know many of us have been thrilled to see many of our sunshine members our friends from Wood Lane back and Derek would like you to celebrate with him that his birthday is in two weeks Forty-seven, big time. Uh, a couple of prayer concerns to lift up among the community of faith. Um, Lee McClaire is requesting prayers for the family of Chris, a father of two who passed away this week at age 35. Prayers also for Bob Stegna as he's having surgery this Wednesday and prayers for a speedy recovery. Um, and many of you remember Connie had surgery a few weeks ago and she wants to thank everyone for their gifts and their cards and their prayers during that time. Friends, I trust that each of us have concerns on our hearts, so I want to invite us into a time of stillness as we approach God in prayer. Holy God, as the rain waters the earth, may your spirit bring an oasis to places where there has long been oppression, death, and poverty. And inspire us as your church to hold fast to your heart, to your heart for the poor in spirit, the desolate, and the broken. Realizing that at one time or another, we have all found ourselves in those places. So God, we come to pray for all of your people throughout the world. We pray for the well-being and flourishment of your beloved children. And we long for the reconciliation of all nations and people. Through your spirit, come and make all of the world Lord, in your mercy. God, as grief and lament fill our days, embolden us to be your prophets. Let cries against oppression and injustice be our prophecy, so the world may know your true peace, a peace that celebrates and protects the beautiful diversity of your world. So equip us with boldness, as you did your early disciples, to engage in this kingdom-building work, and let this peace and this justice be the aim of our communal life and work.
Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray for our community that we call home, for Bowling Green. We pray that all in our community would know that they are deeply loved by you. Remind us that you ask us to be the heralds of this message. God, specifically, we pray for our community partnership. We pray for the neighbors who participate in our food pantry, the families and the staff at Krim Elementary, for our FUM Child Learning Center, and for the Cocoon Shelter. Lord, help us to be better partners to all those serving your world. Lord, in your mercy, we come to pray for those who grieve the loss of a loved one. On this day, we pray specifically for the family of Chris. God, when heartbreak and tears are unending, remind them of your goodness and give them a peace to face uncertain and painful days. Lord, in your mercy. God, you alone are the ruler of your heavenly kingdom. Just as your spirit breathes new life into places of death, cause us to take notice of places where you are bringing new life. Strengthen us while we live out our life on this earth to show the compassion and the caring of Jesus. Hold, us, hold before us the reality of your kingdom where there is no suffering, pain, or regret, so that we may share it with those who are without hope. God, we come together to communally pray all these things in your Son's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. came to them much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they were numbered about five thousand. The next day their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem, with Annas the highest priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of the good deed done to someone who is sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone who was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the men who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they offered to leave them, they offered to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, What will we do with them? 
for it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it, but to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all of them praised God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing had performed was more than 40 years old. The word of God for the people of God. So have you ever been um, in an argument with someone, maybe your spouse or a friend, a co-worker, and what you think you're arguing about isn't really what you're upset about? You know, maybe you're arguing with your spouse over whose turn it is to unload the dishwasher, but what you're really upset about is how much your wife spent on running shoes last weekend. Or maybe you're arguing with your boss about a new policy, but you're not upset about the policy. You're you're just upset that you were passed up for a promotion. You know, sometimes the main thing isn't always the main thing. And I think that's what we've encountered in this text here in Acts 4. And so far this summer, we've really covered a lot of ground in the book of Acts. The apostles at this point are riding high this, this wave of the Holy Spirit. Right, a new movement has begun. Peter preached one sermon, and on that day, 3,000 people joined the church. The early church sold all of their possessions so that they could give money to the poor and the needy. They had all things in common. And miracles were taking place. A man had been healed. Last week, we, we talked about this text where Peter and John were going up to the temple. And there was a man outside begging who had a physical impairment. And he was looking for money. And Peter says, I I can't offer you money, but I can offer you, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And this man was miraculously healed. And people saw this, and they began to take notice. And because so many people were seeing this, the religious leaders heard about it. And we hear from our text today that that they weren't that happy about it. Because this was a fairly big miracle. At the very end of the the text Cole read, Luke tells us that the man who was healed was about 40 years old. And this was important because in this culture, most people believe that that he was too old for any type of cure to occur for him. But also because he was considered a mature man, people believed his story. They would believe that Jesus had really healed him, that there had been a miracle. And so this story is spreading like wildfire. And things are beginning to change. But sometimes when you're doing things differently than you've always done them, or sometimes when change comes about, it can be difficult. It can create tension. And that's what's happening for the early church in in their community. And we've all experienced this in our lives. Rick Reckenmacher was in the office this week, and we were catching up a little bit. But he was telling me that he remembers growing up in northern Virginia where there were separate drinking fountains for white people and African Americans. Maybe some of you remember that. And I know that in our, in our nation's history, things began to change. Some things have changed, and yet many things have remained the same. We know that much progress still needs to be made in affirming all people made in the image of God. The powers to be don't always welcome change. When I was just starting in seminary, we had a bishop who was very focused on recruiting young people to ministry. And he was very passionate about putting resources and money and initiatives behind recruiting young clergy and making sure that they could sustain in in ministry since the, the average burnout rate for pastors is about five years. And at that time, um, every United Meth- or the average age for a United Methodist elder, so an ordained person, was 52 years of age. And so this bishop was putting tons of resources into this, but it was met with much criticism. 
We don't always welcome change in our world. Even if we see that that change is good and that that change is good for everyone. Because the early church, they were doing good things. They were healing people. Things that they'd never experienced before were, were happening. They were taking care of those in their community. But the powers to be, those with the religious authority, didn't like it. And so the Sadducees, we, we encounter them in this text. And they were this high priestly sect. And they were the Jewish nobles that Rome had entrusted them with power for leading the religious movement in the temple in that time. So if you had a religious question or problem, these were the experts that you went to. They were a part of this small percentage of the Judean population who had power. And it's likely that these were the same leaders who rubbed up against Jesus and his ministry in the Gospels. And so one of the theological uniquenesses for the Sadducees is that they didn't believe in the actual resurrection of Jesus. And so it appears that they didn't like that the early apostles were spreading this message. But when they, we read the text, what they were really mad about is that the disciples were gaining influence. They were gaining power. People actually believed that this Jesus thing was the real deal. And you can see how Luke shapes that for us. When he says, when they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered the disciples to leave the council, and they discussed the matter with one another. And they said, what should we do with them? For it's obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let's tell them not to speak to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them to be silent and not to speak or to teach in the name of Jesus. If they were being honest, th this wasn't a theological issue. I mean, we've all encountered theological issues. I have friends who are Christians, and, and we think differently on, on different parts of theology and worship styles. I have friends who, who love coming to online worship. I have friends who love in-person worship. We have differences. You know, we encounter that. But there was something much deeper going on in this text. They were worried about what that would mean for their power, their religious leaders. They were losing influence. And the powerless, these uneducated men, as Luke tells us, were gaining influence. It was less about Jesus' resurrection and more about if Jesus is Lord, this means things have to change. If this crazy guy that we didn't like, who preached about loving our neighbor, really is the Messiah, that changes everything for us. Because that meant that for them, as the religious leaders, they weren't in control anymore. And that's what they're pushing up against in this text. They were no longer in control. The apostle said, Jesus is Lord. And that was revolutionary in this text. You know, one of the questions that, that Methodist pastors that we have to answer from the moment we say that, that we're interested in ministry all the way up to ordination is this question of what does it mean to say that Jesus is Lord? It's essential to our theological training. It's essential to our faith. It's a big discussion that's part of our, our confirmation class. And when we say that Jesus is Lord, what we mean is that Jesus is ultimately in control. That he's the, the ruler of our lives. When we say that, we're essentially affirming what he taught in the Gospels. We're affirming that he's the one who calls us to live differently in our world. We're affirming that he is the one who calls us to love our neighbor. That he's the one who calls us to love and give and to sacrifice. And I think that saying and believing that Jesus is Lord can be really comforting. When we face something completely out of our control, whether that's a terminal diagnosis, a natural disaster, layoffs at work, a divorce, it's often our faith that, that gets us through. When we say, God is God and I am not, and I'm willing to rest in that. We learn that if Jesus reminded us that, that God cares enough to feed the sparrow, surely that God is going to take care of us. It was Apostle Paul who, who wrote in a later letter that 
life or death or angels or demons or fear or worry, nothing can separate us from God's love. And so when our world is shaken and we've completely lost control, we feel entirely helpless, it can be really reassuring to know that Jesus is Lord. That he's not caught off guard by our fears or our failures. He's not caught off guard when we go down the, the wrong path. And it's comforting to know this. That God is God and God is just and God loves us. And I think the early disciples lived into this. But also, if we choose to believe that Jesus is Lord... It can be incredibly challenging. If you're anything like me, you, you rest in the fact that Jesus is Lord during those difficult times in your life. But once things settle down, you kind of want that control back. You're like, thanks God, I, I can take it from here. I know that's been me many times. But if we affirm Jesus is Lord, it's, it's both comforting and challenging. Because that means he, he's Lord of everything. He's Lord when we're sick and in the hospital and scared. He's Lord when we're on vacation. He's Lord when we're not sure how we're going to pay the bills the month. But he's also Lord when we get that big bonus at work. He's Lord when we're discriminated against because of our age or disability. But he's also Lord when we have to own up to how we've hurt others. I think that's why the statement, Jesus is Lord, can, can be so challenging. Because he's Lord when we want him to be in control, and he's Lord when we prefer for him to not be in control. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders pushed up against that, because things were going well for them. They were wealthy. They had influence. They were respected. They had political power. But Jesus and the early church coming along, they threatened all of that. They were worried that this movement, people would start following the early apostles that they wouldn't be able to call the shots anymore, that they wouldn't have the power and the influence. And so they pushed back against that. I think about my own life. When I say Jesus is Lord, I feel a a real sense of comfort and peace. But if I really believe that, then I also have to accept that, that God may call me to make some uncomfortable choices. You know, the Pharisees had their own fears about losing power. But I wonder, what about us when we say Jesus is Lord? Maybe we're nervous about making him Lord of our finances. Maybe we've saved up for retirement, we're ready to buy that lake house we've always wanted, but we're worried that if Jesus is in charge, maybe we forego that luxury and and buy a smaller house so we can live generously. Or maybe we're worried about making Jesus Lord of our relationships. Or maybe we're worried that he's going to ask us to swallow our pride and go apologize to our family for that argument we had last Thanksgiving. Maybe if we say Jesus is Lord, he'll tell us to back away from a romantic relationship we've been pursuing. Or if Jesus is Lord of my time, what does that mean for how I spend my time? It can be a challenge. And following Jesus means that we have to regularly reflect on our, our lives. And that's both an individual process, and I believe it's a communal process. Last summer and and fall, as a church, we we wrestled with the idea of racism. We had many difficult conversations in small groups. I'm still having difficult conversations. And I reflect on my own life, and that's an area where, well, I think Jesus is Lord. I'm actively discerning how I should respond and live in the world. You know, I feel good about myself because I read a few books and listened to a few podcasts and had a few conversations. But then I see how others are responding in our world. And I know that how far I have to go so that Jesus is Lord in my life. And I wonder if following Jesus requires sometimes a little more than, than we think. You know, oftentimes churches will invite Jesus to participate in their church. We decide how things are done, how they've always been done, and we just ask Jesus to come along for the ride. But if we make Jesus Lord, the way we do things may look a lot different. It could mean a a different crowd showing up on Sunday morning. Instead of getting phone calls about hospital visits or weddings or prayer requests, we get calls about 
people who need help with addictions or a request to be bailed out of prison? You know, do we really want to make Jesus Lord? It could change what we spend our money on. It could change how worship looks. It, it can change anything. We know from looking at the early church in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit was entirely unpredictable. So we can almost expect the same. At one point in the Gospels, Jesus asked one guy to, to sell everything he had just to follow him. To 11 of the 12 disciples, Jesus' his Lord meant they were martyred for their faith. So it's both beneficial and challenging. And unfortunately for the Pharisees and the religious leaders in our text, they weren't willing to give up their power. But what I find hopeful at this point in the book of Acts is that the disciples were able to go home free. The religious leaders, those who had power, tried to silence them. But the word still got out. The early church still developed. And I think that's good news. Because it means no matter what, God's message of love and justice and freedom still wins. That God's message is still more powerful than oppression or all the isms that fill our world or death or poverty or illness. God is still God. In a world in which the religious leaders, the one with the power, were trying to stop those without the power, that message went out. People were still healed. Miracles still happened. They still took care of the poor and needy. Because I think when Jesus is Lord, it doesn't matter who has the power. Because that message still finds the way. And maybe it takes the for form of activists, healers, or advocates. It takes the form of Sunday school teachers and volunteers at the elementary school and food pantry givers. It takes the form that's a little bit different. But the Holy Spirit still empowers the church. I think the challenge for us to answer is, how is God calling each of us to live as Jesus as Lord? And are we really ready to respond to that? Would you pray with me? God, we're thankful for your love. And God, your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit that reminds us that, that we are loved beyond measure. And God, your same Holy Spirit that that challenges us to evaluate our lives and see places where we need to continue to make you Lord. God, I'm grateful for this church. God, for this body of Christ who so easily sacrifices so that we can give to your kingdom. But God, remind us that your spirit still challenges us and you still call us to make a difference in our community, even if it can be uncomfortable. So God, ultimately, let us rest in the direction of your Holy Spirit so that we might love the world that you gave your life for. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, this morning, we have the opportunity to receive Holy Communion. On your way in, you would have seen the individual cups. This morning, I want you to take a look at your bulletin. We'll um, be doing more of a modern version of the Great Thanksgiving with some responses, so I invite you to follow along with me in that. And just a reminder that as United Methodist Church, we believe that Christ died once and for all, and we believe that all are welcome to come and receive of Christ's table. God is here with us and with you. Let us give our hearts, intentions, and thoughts over to God. Let's also give thanks to God who gets everything. Giving God our thanks and honor is the best thing we could ever do. So let's do it. God, you created everything, every living thing that was put on earth by you. All people of every nation belong to you. And so together with all creation and everything on earth and in heaven, we give you praise and join the world in this eternal song of praise. God, you're amazing and so is your Son, Jesus Christ. Through your holy plan, Christ's birth, death, and resurrection, your church was born. 
You saved us from the power of sin and eternal death, and you made a new agreement with us through baptism and the Holy Spirit. Christ sent us to tell the whole world about his love, and now we, his family, are joining together at this holy table. A way to remember Christ's perfect love and life, so we happily and thankfully give you back our lives as holy and living sacrifices. Receiving this gift of our life together with Christ's gifts, use us to speak the truth about our faith. Christ dies, Christ lives, Christ is coming again. God, we pray over the blessings of our holy symbols, and we ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit on each person in this room and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be the body and blood of Christ, so that by taking them into our bodies, you will make us the body of Christ for the rest of the world, and everyone will know that sin is redeemed by your life, death, and resurrection. Renew us and help us to remember that we are Christ's church. Strengthen our faith and service in every nation and with all people, so that we can faithfully show and tell the world how much your love can do. Use your Holy Spirit to make us one with Christ, one with each other, so that we can care for the whole world until Christ comes again and we join around your table as a family in perfect love. We proclaim to the world that you possess every good quality, and you deserve all of our honor and obedience now and forever. Amen. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem. After they finished the meal, Jesus took the bread, he broke it, gave it to his friends, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Let us receive Christ's body together. After the, cup, or after the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, blessed it, and said, This is my blood poured out for you, the blood of a new covenant, which represents my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you partake of this meal, do so in remembrance of me. Let us receive the juice together. Let us pray. God, just as the grain that was used to make this bread was once scattered over the land and then gathered together to make this loaf one, gather your people together from all over the world into your one holy and eternal community. God, we thank you that we are able to feast at Christ's dinner table, and we thank you that you welcome all who want to come and eat with you. In the name of Christ, we give thanks for this wonderful gift. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we uh, uh, respond in worship. In the thunder, in the 
we confess so often, we go through entire days without remembering that your spirit is with us. We try to do everything on our own, and we don't give you a second thought. But God, I just pray that you would remind us each and every day that your Holy Spirit is there, your Holy Spirit empowers us, your Holy Spirit comforts us, and your Holy Spirit reminds us that you have some great things in store for us. So God, remind us every day that you are with us. being with us this morning and receive these words of blessing from the book of Numbers. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.